in the Theravada tradition. In the Theravada tradition, you know, usually we think of the Theravada tradition, we think of the discourses on the Four Noble Truths, or the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. But there are three other discourses which are really the most popular suttas in the Theravada tradition. One of these is called the Ratana Sutta, which is a kind of hymn of praise to the three jewels of Buddhism, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The second is the Metta Sutta, the Discourse on Loving Kindness. And then the third is the Sutta that I will be using as the basis for this program. This is called the Mangala Sutta. First, the title of the sutta, the word Mangala, it's a very popular word in Indian culture, even today, and the meaning is something like blessings, or good fortune, good luck. And so just as in, even in, <laughs> in our sophisticated scientific Western culture, we still have certain actions and symbols that we take to be signs of good luck. Like somebody says when they're going to take, undertake some particular job, they'll say, I'll cross my fingers behind my back. Is that the point? You know, I'm a little bit out of touch with Western culture. <laughs> <laughs> Having lived for 22 years in Sri Lanka, and then coming and now spending like <laughs> last but 12, 14 years at Chinese monasteries. But don't we cross the fingers and say, I cross my fingers behind my back, is that true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay, good, uh, confirmation. <laughs> and, <laughs> and some people in their cars, they have, it's a little bit cruel, but the paw of a rabbit. Is that true? A rabbit paw, they think that will bring good luck. And if not for the rabbit. <laughs> Not for the rabbit. <laughs> Sorry. And if one sees, I remember in childhood, if you see a four-leaf clover, you say, ah, I'm lucky I found a four-leaf clover. So if we were to use the Indian word for that, the ancient Indian word, it would be Mangala. And so that is the topic of this discourse, except the Buddha is going to explain what he understands to be real mangalas, real sources of blessing and of good luck. Sutta, the Buddha is going to explain this concept of mangala, of blessings, in terms of 38 qualities, practices, <coughs> virtues, and so forth, actions that constitute, in his view, the real source of blessings, the real source of good luck. And I look through the sutta, we always recite the sutta just almost in a mechanical way. In fact, before I became a monk, when I was on my way in the airport from Bangkok to Colombo, 1972, end of October 1972, I had a little book with some popular suttas from the Theravada Buddhist tradition. And this was the first sutta that I started to memorize <laughs> in Pali. 
And so we usually just recite it, Asevena Chabalana and Panditananta Sevena. But as I looked through the sutta, I found that the sutta is extremely well structured and that one could divide the different blessings in the sequence of verses into a kind of meaningful structure, a meaningful pattern, a kind of gradually unfolding pattern. And so I added, in my own thinking about the sutta, I added sort of section headings to show how these virtues or these qualities unfold. And so first I just want to go very quickly over the whole, what I call the ground plan of the Mangala Sutta. And then over the next couple of days, we're going to look at each of these so-called blessings in greater detail. <laughs> okay, it's okay that he hears you, so he'll just take a comfortable seat. And <laughs> somebody that he has a karma connection with <laughs> or he wants to cultivate a new karma <laughs> okay so we have first verse you can see proper orientation and so we have here not to associate with foolish people to associate with wise people to honor those worthy of honor Okay, now we have what the section that I call establishing secure foundations. So that says establishing the inner and outer requisites for success in life. So we have residing in a suitable locality, having done meritorious deeds in, past, in the past, and setting oneself on the right course or right resolution. Okay, then we come to the stage that I've called preparations. So this is training oneself for success in life. And so this will include things like obtaining abundant learning or well-rounded education, learning skill in some craft, trade, profession, being well-grounded in a code of ethics, to guide or code of discipline, to guide one's conduct, and then well-spoken speech, speaking properly, and also learning the wise sayings of others. Okay, then comes the next section that I call leading a virtuous life in the world. And so this is the section especially intended for those who are going to live as virtuous, well-disciplined householders who are not entering the monastic life, but taking up a household life. So this, but also some of these qualities also apply to monastics. So first comes fulfilling one's family responsibilities, supporting one's parents, maintaining a wife or husband and children, then earning one's living by right livelihood, by a harmless occupation. And then going beyond the narrow circle of one's own family, one's own family circle, comes a verse that I say relates to becoming a pillar of society being able to make a meaningful contribution to one's community. So this includes generosity, virtuous conduct, righteous conduct, oops, assistance to relatives and friends, and then engaging in a multitude of other types of blameless actions, actions intended to promote the well-being and happiness of others. Okay, then with the next verse, the way I say it, and I'll explain this more when we actually come to this verse, we make the transition to what I would say is entering 
upon the proper Buddha's path. So what comes before this, I say, is just the general ethical way of life that would have been common to followers of any religious tradition in ancient India in the Buddha's time. Whether it was followers of the Buddha, followers of Brahmanism, followers of Jainism, or even those who are living like a secular way of life today. This would be all sort of just the basic qualities of a good human being within the context of family and society. But next comes the development or the acceptance of a code of personal ethics that are intended to lead one on a life of moral integrity after one has made the commitment to the Buddhist Dharma and wants to progress step by step through the Dharma. So this starts with So des desisting from evil conduct, deliberately abstaining from evil, refraining from the use of intoxicants, and being heedful in all sorts of wholesome practices. So this is sort of fulfilling the qualities, basic qualities of sila in the Buddhist training. And then moving a few steps deeper, into acquiring inner virtues. So we have here such qualities as inner virtues and also laying the foundations for the development of, of wisdom. So here we have reverence, humility, contentment, and gratitude. So those are types of virtues. So we call these the inner moral virtues, the ethical virtues. And then to lay the foundation for developing wisdom and insight comes timely listening to the Dharma. Okay, so these two verses overlap. So again, we have some virtues, inner virtues, patience, and being amenable to advice. And then the next two are qualities that conduce to developing wisdom seeing renunciants, monastics, drawing near to them in order to learn the Dhamma from them, and then from time to time with one's friends or with one's teachers having timely discussion on the Dhamma. Okay, so all of this is building up the foundations for moving into the next verse, which I give it the subtitle, The Ascent Towards Realization, like moving, sort of stepping on the accelerator. And <laughs> like Nicole here driving with her little, I call it the jet mobile, and the speed. <laughs> so this is going into that speed lane, and stepping on the gas pedal. So this is moving towards the world transcending Dharma, the Dharma of liberation. So this includes what is here called tapas, austerity, the spiritual life culminating in the direct insight into the Four Noble Truths, and then the realization of Nibbana. And then the final verse, the next to final verse, is what I call fulfillment, so this is what I give it the subtitle, Embodying the Dhamma of Liberation in the World. And so this is expressed as having a mind that cannot be shaken by the fluctuations of life, a mind that is sorrowless, stainless, and secure. And then the last verse just sort of applauds the accomplishments of those who achieve those blessings and says that they are victorious everywhere and they attain security everywhere. So that's the kind of overview of the Mangala Sutta. And then I 
prepared a little file in which I look more closely at this quality that I've been calling mandala. So the meaning of mandala, the way the Buddha understands it, is that which brings benefits. Actually, that is the way the, the word mandala would have been commonly understood, understood by everybody in Indian society. That which brings benefits and happiness. But the problem is that most people are seeking benefits and happiness in ways that we would consider superstitious. Some of the ways I mentioned before, the rabbit's foot, crossing the fingers, maybe um, gambling, you know, when you gamble, and then when you gamble, you, you see people when they throw the dice, don't they do something to ensure that the dice will, <laughs> will fall in the right way? <laughs> I don't have any experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the people think if they do those things, they're going to get the benefit, that they'll win, that they'll be victorious, and see security everywhere. But the Buddha takes blessings to be things that lead to three kinds of blessings, three kinds of well-being and happiness that are the aims of the practice of the Buddha's teachings. You know, too often we think, I have to say a little critically, we think uh, Buddhism means oops, meditation, just sit there, gain enlightenment, realize Nibbana, and that's Buddhism. But when we look at the Buddha's teachings, you know, very comprehensively, we see that the Buddha teaches the Dharma to people at different levels of development, in different walks of life, with different needs, different capacities for understanding, different aspirations. And this is part of the meaning of Dhamma. The Dhamma is not just highest realization, the ultimate truth, but the Dhamma is, the word Dhamma means that which upholds and supports. So that which upholds and supports us in our quest to avoid suffering and to find well-being and happiness. And so the Buddha speaks about three kinds of well-being and happiness that are possible in human existence. And his teaching, his teaching of the Dhamma, Is intended to show the way to achieve those kinds of well-being and happiness. So one of them is, in Pali the expression is dita dhamika atta, which could be translated the good here and now, the good visible in this life, the good pertaining to this present life. And that includes such things as worldly success. Now, the Buddha doesn't rule out worldly success as a worthy aim of life, if that's what one wants. Even success in business, the Buddha will show you how to establish the conditions for success in business. Gaining respect from others, how to win the respect and admiration of people in one's community. Not to boost up one's ego, but because that is a good of human life. How to establish cordial relations with others, wholesome friendships with others. How to have a happy, harmonious, and fulfilling family life. You know, the Buddha had like maybe you know, again, when we read the suttas, again and again, we come to see the suttas, the Buddha saying, Bhikave, Bhikave, O monks, O monks, O monks. But probably, if we looked at the Buddha's circle of disciples when he's giving a, a lecture, maybe the monks are in the first few rows, but there might be dozens of rows behind the monks and nuns, dozens of rows with lay people sitting there. 
So he has to speak to them about how to achieve healthy, harmonious, happy family life. How to establish an equitable, just and peaceful society in which people can live together on friendly, cordial terms and work together for the well-being of the whole. And ideally, how to establish, well, let's say the next step, how to establish a peaceful, righteous nation. The Buddha even lays down codes and values and ideals for kings and monarchs and princes. And in that way, how to establish a peaceful world. So these are all benefits, blessings, goods pertaining to the here and now. Okay, the next is the good pertaining to future lives. Because the Buddha doesn't say that the whole purpose of his teaching is to realize some kind of benefits just in this life here and now. But the Buddha teaches that this life is just like one little link in a chain of lives. And if we look back into the past, we can see the beginning of that chain. And if we look into the future, it extends indefinitely into the future until we cut the chain by attaining Nibbana. And so as long as we are going to go on from this life to the future lives, we have to or should, if we're wise, plant the seeds, establish the conditions that are going to bring favorable, desirable results in the future. And this is not just so that we could get reborn in the heaven world and then enjoy the delights of the heavens, playing our harps and singing beautiful songs and playing games in the parks all for thousands and thousands of years. But we want to establish those kind of conditions that are going to bring us into, what I say, favorable circumstances where we meet, we meet the opportunity to encounter the Dhamma and then progress in our, in our progress in future lives. And so, to advance, we have to understand the law of karma and its fruit, and we have to establish the karma conditions that will lead to success in the future. And then, as we know from the suttas, the Buddha teaches that all realms of, of existence within the cycle of birth and death are ultimately dukkha, unsatisfactory subject to, suffer, <coughs> to suffering. And therefore the Buddha teaches that the ultimate goal, the ultimate good, the paramatta, is to break the cycle of birth and death and gain liberation, nibbana. Okay, so those are, I would say, three levels in the meaning of mangala. And as we'll see, all three of them are, are covered in the Mandala Sutta. And what I found very impressive about the Mandala Sutta, some of the characteristics of the Mandala series, and we're going to see this as we go through the series over the next couple of days, that we find that the, that the series has certain characteristics so one is that it's comprehensive, exhaustive. So when we view them all together, and just thinking of that ground plan that I went over a few minutes ago, we see that they provide a holistic picture, a comprehensive picture of the good life, going from the earliest stages to the most advanced stages. Second characteristic, that it's sequential. That is, the blessings unfold 
and we say more or less a progressive series so that the earlier blessings tend to serve as the basis, the foundation for the ones that follow and the ones that follow build upon the foundation established by the earlier blessings. Third, the sequence is, we could call it self-catalyzing, in that each stage has within it the seeds or potential to give rise to the next stage. Of course, people can stop at certain stages and say, that's enough for me. But if one aspires for the ultimate end of the whole series, then each stage will give rise to its successor. In the series, I say that it's multi-dimensional in that it covers multiple aspects of human life. As we've already seen through that brief overview, the preparation for a good life, family life, social life, the inner moral life, development of wisdom, and the renunciate monastic life aimed at liberation. So it covers the personal and interior, family, community, and society, the spiritual, and the transcendent. And another quite surprising or impressive thing about the Buddha's teaching, in this sutta, and I find this in so many other suttas, that it's universal. So these are, they let, especially the sutta lays down general principles that can be applied to virtually any culture, any country, and any era. You know, if you look at, I don't know if you're familiar with the Upanishads and the stipulations of the Dharma codes of Hinduism, so specific to Indian culture, you just can't transpose it any place else, which is probably why Hinduism has been pretty much in its real multiple aspects confined to India and a few countries influenced, strongly influenced by Indian culture. But you take these principles from Buddhism, and this is why Buddhism could spread to South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, the Himalayan regions, and now to Western countries. The principles are universal. They're not only universal, but they're practical. Just about all of these principles are practical. The things that, that are relevant to our lives, they're not just doctrines, not just theories, but all of them are individual guidelines to right living and right attitudes, right thinking. And so when we adopt them and put them into practice, they give dignity to our lives. They enable us to live with inner dignity and self-respect and to win the respect of others. They give purpose and meaning to our lives and they enrich our lives in many ways, in ways that can't be matched by any kind of material wealth. Okay, so this is a sort of introduction or an overview of the Mangala Sutta. And so I think now it's maybe 9.30. I won't ask for questions now because it's late. <laughs> and I think just about everything that I've covered very briefly tonight will be, will be examining in greater detail tomorrow and then on Sunday. So how do you usually end the session? <laughs> uh, however you wish. <laughs> okay, what I will do, there are some verses that I always chant called the sharing or dedication of the merit. And these are verses in Pali by which we share the merits of speaking on the Dhamma and listening to the Dhamma. So we share this merit with other beings I guess 
summer time when the balance of scale of just speaking on right through the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Do you develop that sort of ability um, without I, paying attention to it? <laughs> sometimes I pause when it's really pause. Out. Yeah. Sometimes they're quite low. <laughs> please, uh, please, please, live on. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up your noise when you go away. Okay, so we're going to share the merits with we call these the Dhamma protecting devas. These are the deities or divine beings who protect the Dharma in the world. We share the merits with the Nagas, those are the dragon spirits that in some way are said to regulate the weather. And then the Buddhas or the fierce spirits that eliminate the obstacles to the Dharma. And then with all beings in all the world. So I'll recite in the Pali language, and while I'm reciting, you can send out thoughts of loving kindness towards these beings and all of these different realms. Akasa ta chabhumata deva naga mahitika punyantam anamodipa chiram rakantu sasanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Magamodipa Punyanta Namodipa Chirangura Kantu Devisanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Nagamahidika Punyanta Namodipa Chirangura Kantu Mantaram Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Pony Sampadam Sabe Deva Nomodam Tu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Patacham Hehi Sampadam Pony Sampadam Sabe Bhuta Anomodam Tu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Patacham Hehi Sampadam Pony Sampadam Sabe Satanomodam Tu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Pavagopadaya Vichiheta Tau Etantare Satakaya Papana Rupiya Rupicha Asanya Sanino Dukkha Pavuchantu Pusantu Nibhutin Okay, so good night and thank you all for listening.